I have all these things. And so, um, uh, I don't know. I, I have books. I have, uh, I've, I've produced over a dozen movies about uh, horticulture, about um, uh, uh, rocket mass heaters, about uh, natural building and permaculture stuff. So this is kind of my thing. Um, uh, there's, uh, I've developed a, uh, programs. Um, we recently did the Garden Master Course, which we just got online a little bit ago, like a couple months ago, I think. Um, anyway, there's, there's oodles and oodles. Here they come. And so there's uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, so there's, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff, but <clears throat> uh, it's too late now. All right, let's see. Come on. How do I, how do I, there it goes. <clears throat> Devious experiments for a truly passive greenhouse. <clears throat> we have to call it a truly passive greenhouse because um, there's all these different people that say stuff about, um, oh, look, a passive greenhouse. And in order to make this passive greenhouse work, here's this giant fan that makes it work. And I'm kind of thinking like, do you not understand what the word passive means? So basically what they're trying to say is that they've got a geothermal greenhouse a non-passive greenhouse. They have a giant tube that goes into the ground and then comes back. And then they blow air in on one side, and maybe suck air out of the other side. And that because of that, then all of the warm air that might be here right now goes down to the ground. And then six months later, they're going to bring that warm air back. So that's not passive. The giant fan makes it not passive. Well, we wanted something that would be truly passive. So we built it. Uh, we tested it the, the first year. So last winter, not this winter, last winter, we measured everything very, very carefully. It got to 12 below uh, outside and it stayed above freezing all winter. Zero energy used. So no fans, no solar panels of any kind. Um, it's but we're going to talk about in detail. Now, uh, an important thing is, is that from nearly every greenhouse, it is, uh, once it gets dark outside, like if it gets dark and cold, um, like if it gets down to zero, the temperature inside the greenhouse will probably be something like 10, maybe 8 degrees. I mean, most greenhouses get very, very cold when it's dark and cold out. And so, there's ways to mitigate it. There's a, a variety of different techniques. There's a place over near Bozeman where they managed to uh, uh, gain like two growing zones, but, uh, and it's passive. They don't have any fans or anything like that, but it still freezes in there in the wintertime. So we wanted to go beyond that. So this is an experimental thing that we did. Um, we built, we do a lot with roundwood timber framing and uh, uh, we did, so that's what we used here. And I think uh, there's a, the, the guy that built it, if you go to permies.com greenhouse, you can see it down here, then uh, you'll be able to see the full movie, uh, which uh, is not free. Uh, but this was just wonderful that this guy, he recorded every step he was doing it. We used trees from on site. We used clay and sand from on site. So we make adobe with that. And so a, a part of the structure is made with adobe. Most of it's with the, the logs. We used zero cement. Is everybody here familiar with why you don't want to use cement? Is there anybody who does not know? Oh, there's a few. OK, all right. So um, uh, first of all, the carbon footprint is insane. I think it's something like our, our total global carbon footprint is 7% comes from cement. And then on top of that, nearly every company that sells concrete uh, has been purchased by a company that had some sort of toxic gick they were trying to get rid of. And, and the, the cost of disposal was very high. But they are allowed to take their toxic waste and work it into cement, because then it gets encapsulated. And it's considered then to be safe. So. Uh, how many people want to use cement now? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can make your own cement. There's, there's ways. But we tend to use a lot of cob or adobe, which kind of uh, 
is much easier to work with, and it's just sand, clay, and sometimes straw. And uh, as long as you don't get it wet, it's rather cement like. Who here has worked with cob or adobe? A few, okay, yeah, and it's, it's, it's like a rock. It turns into something rock-like, and you just spritz it with a bit of water, and it's back to being mud. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna see a fair bit of cob today. Zero paint. I think everybody can understand why I don't wanna use paint. Uh, minimal plastic and some sil silicone caulk. I mean, we've got glass on the front, and so we sealed it with a bit of silicone. Um, and there is some plastic involved in this structure, in the membrane, although you know, there was some conversation earlier about how you might seal something like that without using that. And uh, while we have not conducted those experiments yet, we are familiar with people that are trying. Okay, the other passive designs are a joke. And um, we do a lot of experimenting with different kinds of thermal mass and passive systems um, and so this all kind of came about with the idea of can we pull this off? Can we, can we make this leap? So who here is familiar with the work of Mike Ayler? Anybody? Oh, several people. Good, 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 good. So Mike Ayler lived up in Bonners Ferry. He wrote a very popular book called The $50 and Up Underground House Book. And then he came out with another book that was about greenhouses. And uh, I went up to his place several times and um, uh, I got to see the greenhouse, and let me tell you, it is, it is not sealed. It is a very leaky structure, and, uh, but he was growing tomatoes in December, and so it was doing really very well, even though it was a very, you know, lets the cold blow through. So uh, uh, he was definitely on to something. Oh, and then uh, there's this little thing about his book from the 50... So there's somebody who built an Ehler structure, and uh, they had two acres, and it was in Europe somewhere. And, um, and it says here, Mike Ehler built his own four-bedroom home. Nope, 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 that's not, that's not accurate. Uh, um, <clears throat> there was somebody else who built an Ehler structure, and uh, the Department of Making You Sad showed up while this guy was tending his garden. And they said, we understand that you've built a house here, and you, ha you don't have uh, uh, the, the permits for it, and you owe us money for taxation on it. And the guy said, well, I guess if you could point it out to me, I'll have to pay taxes on it. And they couldn't. <laughs> they couldn't see it. I mean, it's effectively invisible. It's like, I think this design is like the ultimate gardener's design in that <clears throat> once it's done, it's, it's covered in growies. And you got all the growies out front, and you got all the growies all around. It just looks like a great big garden, but there's a, there's a home in there. I, and that would be a whole nother presentation for another day. So, oh, oh, we got this. We got one of these. All right, cool. Let's see if I can do this. I gotta, you gotta tap it just right. There it goes. And we'll find out if the sound's working. Do we have a sound? No, we don't. Okay, so some fat guy in overalls. He wants to, he wants to do a, a, some kind of gray water system, but uh, you know, gray water doesn't do good in the winter. And uh, so he's like, hey, you know what would be cool is, oh, <laughs> is this. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Once upon a time, we got an idea to install a gray water system so water from a kitchen sink could go to plants instead of to a septic tank. Except those plants will be dormant in winter, so any funky sink stuff would just build up and be gross. How about if we made a small greenhouse? Greenhouses are famous for needing more heat than homes. All that glass is a very poor insulator. Plus, they can get too hot on a sunny day and kill everything in the greenhouse. We have a lot of projects here doing amazing things to solve heating problems. So can we invent a greenhouse that never gets too cold or too hot? Maybe we can use some elements of Mike Ehler's greenhouse design 
and some elements of our Wafati design, and maybe a few other ideas. Our design starts with the general shape of Mike Ehler's design from the Earth Sheltered Solar Greenhouse book. He grew tomatoes in December off-grid with no heat of any kind in northern Idaho. The genius of his design includes three improvements over a traditional greenhouse. Improvement number one, reduce the size of the airspace with a trench. Improvement number two, an earth berm on the north side, thus some added insulation and less glass. Improvement number three, most importantly, the five foot deep trench under the walkway. I think that the trench adds a big dose of superpowers that most people overlook. If the deep ground temperature is a constant 50 degrees, then whenever the temperature in the greenhouse drops below 50, the 50 degree air from the trench will rise up and the colder air will sink down. Before he died, I talked to Mike about another possible improvement. Improvement number four. What if a copper pipe was blackened, shaped to follow the glass vertically, and drop down near the bottom of the trench? When the sun hits the greenhouse, the top of the pipe would heat up and act like a straw to pull cold air from the bottom of the trench. Eventually, the hot air at the top of the greenhouse would be pulled into the trench and warm it. I called it a de-stratification pipe. Mike agreed that this would probably help a lot. Improvement number five. A common farmer trick is to put 20 feet of well casing into the ground, then put a watering trough on top of that. When the outdoor temperature is negative 25 degrees, the water doesn't freeze. When the water gets cold, it cools the air at the top of the hole. So the 50 degree air from underground rises to the top and the colder air right below the trough sinks. There's so much air exchange that the water remains warm enough to not freeze. With this trick, plus the previous improvements, maybe we can circulate enough heated air from the greenhouse through the pipe to get the temperature at the bottom of the hole closer to 70 degrees instead of 50. Improvement number six. Our Wafati house design attempts to use heat from the summer to heat a home through winter. We do this by berming dry earth against and on top of the structure and keep it dry with the membrane we call the umbrella. We're still experimenting with these structures, but so far they've had no freeze, even in our Montana winters. So let's add dry dirt to the roof, the west side, the east side, and the north side, and an umbrella to keep that thermal mass dry. Improvement number seven. Our original mission was to design a year-round gray water system for a cold climate. In this case, the problem is the solution. Gray water tends to be warm. If part of the greenhouse is dedicated to accepting gray water, then there's a constant stream of warmth pouring into the greenhouse. All right, let's see, can I get it to go to the next? There it goes. <clears throat> So let's see, uh, we've been doing a lot with roundwood timber framing. We're getting better and better and better at it. Um, not many people in the United States do much with roundwood. Um, there's some timber framing stuff going on, but they tend to uh, do it with cants or uh, also known as you know, just squared off timbers, big timbers. They start off with logs and they kind of they shave it down into some sort of uh, squared kind of thing or rectangular kind of a thing. We like to work with round wood, um, and so we do a lot with that. Um, let's see. The Wafati design. Um, I, I saw Jackie a second ago. There she is. And of course, some of our uh, other residents uh, from our place. But um, uh, I mean, how, who's been inside of a Wafati like when it's over 100 degrees outside? Okay, just Stephen. You, you've been in a Wafati? You've been in one of my Wafatis? No. John Hates structure. Not, not Hates. Not Hates. Oh. 
ones that didn't have any growth. Oh, okay, okay. That I'm not familiar with. I've, I've, uh, I've been. There are two hate structures in in Missoula, and um, I don't know where they are. But I, somebody had a line on them once, and like talked to the owner, and I was going to be able to go get a tour and see it and talk to him and interview him. But um, apparently that got uh, squashed. But all right, Stephen, when it's a hundred and four outside, what's the temperature inside the Wafati? Like seventy degrees, maybe even colder than that. Yeah. I, I usually think about seventy four. Like if we if we had a we should get a thermometer and put it in there to know for sure's, but uh, but it is seems like when the, when it gets really hot we all we all head over to the Wafatis and hang out in there. Um, Jackie, were you ever in a Wafati when it was like really hot out? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we've got these designs. We've built some some homes. And um, the, the testing is continuing, and they're doing quite well. So um, we did this process where we uh, designed this structure that we wanted to build. We designed this greenhouse. And uh, this is one of the earliest designs, which we later rejected. And then we started to build it. So here you can see a, a picture. This is the well casing that we're going to be putting in later. And it needs to be put in pretty deep. Uh, and we're going to need to dig it down. So fortunately, we happen to have an excavator on site so we can dig these nice deep holes. Now, earlier I mentioned cob or adobe. And so as the structure, here's the structure getting built right now. And uh, what we do is we pin these logs up onto the uh, skeleton of the structure. And then we fill the gaps with, with cob. So this is just basically sand and clay that's mixed at a good ratio uh, to, to make it so that you, you glom it all together and then you smear it on and then uh, it eventually turns to something resembling cement once it dries. It doesn't cure. Cement makes a chemical bond and uh, cob does not. Cob merely dries. All right, so here is the, the trench below the trench. Here's the guy that was leading the build, who took all the video and made the movie possible. Uh, this is Josiah Kobernick. And uh, here you can kind of see how we've got, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm particularly proud of the joinery work that he did down here. And uh, so notice how we don't go into this log very deep and uh, in order to make a bit of a flat spot to sit on top of that post, there's also, a pin right here to help hold this log onto that. Now there are ways to do it without any metal at all. And if you can build a structure like this without any metal, then when you die, you go to a special woodworker's Valhalla. <laughs> I think some of our people aspire to be there someday. Um, <clears throat> but on this project, we were taking, we were doing so many experiments and doing so much. When you do it without any metal whatsoever, it does tend to make the joinery take three times longer. And so um, we, we kind of tried to come up with a, a, a style of joinery that was fast and all of our pins would be hidden. And there's not very many, there's just a few. Who here has done any timber, timber framing of any kind? One couple of people, okay, all right, cool. So have you, did, did I see, you did. A little bit, a little bit. Okay. Um, so I I made the mistake of leaving the excavator there, which means that <laughs> how many people here have ever driven an excavator? It is fun. <laughs> but uh, so I should not have left the excavator there because next thing you know, because they I imagine these guys could have picked this log up and put it there themselves. But when you got an excavator right there, so they've, they've, they've stuck it on the excavator and made the excavator lift it up there and put it up there. But you could kind of get an idea of the kind of joinery that's about to happen. Um, so forgive me as what I want to do is I want to turn this whole presentation into stuff about roundwood timber framing and joinery because I'm very excited about that. Is there anybody here who wants to hear about roundwood timber framing and joinery? I imagine everybody's here for the greenhouse. Who's, who's here for joinery? 
Who's here for greenhouse? Okay, yeah, all right, that's what I figured. I'm giving the same presentation in about a month uh, uh, over in Tennessee, and uh, uh, they want the joinery. <laughs> so um, here we can see it uh, coming together. Here we can see them putting in some of those uh, metal pins. And I think that the design, this particular design ended up being probably about three times more sophisticated than it needed to be. Dr. Watson, what are you doing? Are, are you doing a little sewing? You're doing a little mending. N nice, nice. Oh, oh yeah, and knitting, okay. All right, little, little, little needle and thread mending. So did you, did you bring a need, just keep a needle and thread with you all the time? Smart. All right, um, the, it looks a little bit like a log cabin. But instead, what we do is we, we build the frame with good joinery, nice and strong, and then most of the logs are kind of tacked on, like not even, not even attached well enough to be of much strength. Sometimes we even don't attach them at all because once they get their membrane on them and then they get a bunch of dirt, the dirt will pin them on and hold them in place. Um, <clears throat> especially with the little bit of cob that we put on the back, um, the cob kind of acts like a, a glue, a log glue, to hold it all together. And so then we just, you can see how we kind of just lay these logs on the roof. Lots of cob. So, I mean, in this case, we're putting a whole bunch of cob on the roof, and we do the same thing with the walls, so when we put the membrane down, then the membrane is less likely to get punctured. So it's a, it's a much smoother interface. And of course, whenever there's cob, I don't know, it kind of turns into a cob party. For all those that have worked with it before, I'm sure that you got to stomp some cob and the, the music gets going and, and everybody's like, it's cob day and hallelujah. So here we are, we're using actual plastic for the membrane. Here's some more joinery I want to talk about for an hour. And then, um, so now we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to put the framework in for the glass for the greenhouse. And so we're going to cut these logs a little bit short, more, more cob. And cob's the same thing as adobe. And in fact, I've heard some people say we should stop calling it cob. We need to, we need to make sure we always call it adobe um, because uh, uh, adobe started in South America and um, where it was called adobe. And cob is uh, an English thing from the, the white oppressors. And, uh, and plus, the, 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 the word cob is confusing. People think of corn cobs or cob salad and, and things of that nature instead of you know, uh, sand and uh, clay, sometimes straw. So the, framery, the framework for the, uh, for the glass is, a, is going in here. Oh. This is, this is like the best reason to get the movie. Um, so we had a guy there, uh, he's a bow maker. And uh, so he made the doorknob have a, a wooden spring. And so he made this, this wooden latch on it. So um, here you can see the bow inside that's acting as the spring. And so that's the guy there, Kyle. That's the back of his head. <laughs> and and there's, the, there's the door that he made that, that's just absolutely stunning. The glass is going in. There's a better picture of Kyle on the right. And so these are the boots at the boot camp. And so we have, in fact, uh, uh, we had two boots arrive yesterday, and they're back there. And it's like, yeah, you get to, this is the kind of thing you're going to be doing. Jackie knows. <laughs> in fact, Jackie, are you, have you seen you in any of these pictures yet? Did you work on the greenhouse? I worked on the French after the French. Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> little little shovely. A bunch of gravel got stuck, and we had to dig it out. Oh, that! Is that the one where Josiah's over there with the vacuum? <laughs> So here's the glass in place, 
And here's, here's Josiah kind of describing what's been built. And here, here's the, the trench under the, well, this is the, the trench that's under the walkway. Um, and then the, this picture shows where, okay, so, so in the little video, it talked about the idea of putting these 20-foot long well casings in. And then we run these de-stratification pipes all the way down there. So <clears throat> the walkway is about three feet down. And then there's a trench below that, five feet, where Josiah is currently sitting. And then it goes another 19 feet below that. And we put the de-stratification pipes down in there. So this is all in an attempt to get it to be truly passive. It's, so, so well casing is when you're going to go and, and put a hole in the ground like maybe 300 feet deep. So you'll put a whole bunch of those well casings one after another to get down to the water. And then um, and usually the well casing kind of, you know, holds all the stuff back. And then you've got like plumbing and wiring going down to the water. So does that help? But, but they'll sell it to anybody to use for whatever they want. If you've got the money, they'll let you take it home. But for this, you're just using it as your straw to transport. Your Air. Yeah, yeah. So in this particular spot, we've, we have gone on to this property many times, and we've dug holes as deep as like 24 to 40 feet deep. And um, so we've got these really beautiful, deep alluvial soils um, that just seem to go forever. So uh, when we're digging down, we encountered some clay. We had a clay layer, but then we got back down below that. There was more gravel and sand. So this whole thing is being placed in some place where you know, any water that gets into this uh, well casing will go down onto Savile and Grand and uh, uh, gravel and sand and then disappear. And, and so I guess the, so this is black copper, is that right? The painted black copper? No, it's, it's mild steel. Yeah. So it's, if it's air exchange, and that's, this is more for heating or for cooling? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> in the, if you have a really hot day, then um, what you want to have happen is you want all this heat to not kill everything inside your greenhouse. So the de-stratification pipes, which are sitting in the glass, are going to get heated up. And now they kind of turn into straws. And they start pulling air up from the bottom. And, then, um, and so now there's this warm air in this space, which now gets pulled down to the bottom of those well casings. So on a hot, sunny day, it doesn't get too hot in the greenhouse. And then, later, it's going to be uh, 12 degrees below zero outside. And then the 12 degrees wants to infect the interior of the greenhouse. So there's cold in the greenhouse. But the bottom of the well casing is warmer. And warm air rises and cold air drops. So another exchange of air. But, you know, it's kind of exactly the same, but completely different. OK. Any more questions about the well casing? Because, I mean, that's kind of, we're here for the greenhouse, right? How do we do this truly passive thing? I mean, I think that the profound thing is going to be how we have warmed a space so dramatically. I mean, a greenhouse is one of the most difficult things to warm. Who here has done greenhouse stuff before? And, okay, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. And so, difficult to heat? Yeah. Expensive to heat? Son of a bitch. It's, it is crazy how expensive it can be to heat a greenhouse. And so many people are like, I'm going to have this greenhouse. And they got all these visions of what's going to happen. And then, you know, it's like not too far into the fall and everything's dead. And it's like, what? It's supposed to be a greenhouse. No, man, you've got like so much poor insulation. It's, it's, you know, there's ways, there's stuff, but 
Ah, in the end, it's about the heat. In fact, um, I, uh, last month, how many people here were from my presentation last month? A few. Okay, cool, cool. Um, the average carbon footprint for an adult in the United States is 30 tons per year. If you heat a Montana home with electricity, the carbon footprint is 29 tons. That's for the average uh, Montana home. And when I mention this, there's always somebody in the audience who wants to say, yeah, but hardly anybody heats with electric in Montana. And it's like, nope, it's 25%. 25%. And uh, the carbon footprint used to be touted as nine tons per year but new uh, for, for natural gas. But now <coughs> it's uh, considered to be closer to uh, 20 tons per year. And it's hard to get the numbers to be rock solid because of well, comedy from the industry, uh, who is trying to like pretend like that's not really happening. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, is that with this greenhouse, if we proceed down this road even further, which is what we're trying to do with the Wafati style homes, can we make a home that uses the heat from the summer to heat the home through the winter? In which case your carbon footprint would be zero. So now a lot of people believe that the best thing you could do for your carbon, to reduce your carbon footprint is to get an electric car, but that's going to reduce your carbon footprint by two tons per year. Not, not as much of a dent as you might hope. So I believe that this kind of thing is the most profound. Oh, and we should get, throw a little respect out. Who, who here believes that all this stuff about carbon footprint is a bunch of bullshit? There's usually, okay, there's one. One person. There's usually a few. And it's like, fair enough. Fair enough. It either is bullshit or it isn't. And it's like, uh, but I think how many people here are very concerned about it? All right. So I think, I think that if you're a person that believes that it's a bunch of bullshit and you're talking to somebody, you could say, hey, what are you doing about your heat? And uh, not a fucking thing. Well, then shut the fuck up. So, <clears throat> all a little art. Magdalene made that. <coughs> Here's the final product on the interior. And so uh, you can kind of see this uh, a, a cob wall here. I think is very handsome. And you can kind of see how the logs over here got finished with cob and it looks very nice. And so, uh, Josiah came and uh, he learned about roundwood timber framing at Wheaton Labs. Uh, we have another movie about that, building the berm shed, and then um, and then he wanted to build this, and so it's like okay. Here we are putting in the uh, tracking thermo, not tracking thermometer. It's just a, a thermometer with a remote sensor, so we can kind of see what is the temperature of the mass and the temperature. This is a picture of what is the temperature inside at the moment. So it's a very sunny day, and the temperature inside is 83 degrees. And so there, there were days where it was like uh, um, pushing 100 degrees outside, and we would go in, inside, and you would think it would be like 140, but instead it was, it was closer to like 95. So it was still quite warm, but not as warm as outside. So during, during the summer, all that mass surrounding it is absorbing the heat, So uh, which is why... Uh, our wafatis are so cool in the summer. So it was doing that wafati action. Plus, it was doing that air exchange down into uh, the, uh, the thermal wells. So you're talking about on a structure that has a, a roof completely over, except there's just a slant? To the south. Only there's glass to the south. Summertime, it's not going to be penetrating into that greenhouse. That is true. So the, it's a, it's a, a, a a very common passive solar technique. And so uh, what you do is you set it all up so you're going to harvest a lot of sun in the winter when the, when the sun is, let's see, that's south. So we're going to have our glass like this and it's fairly steep. And so when the sun is low in the south, we're going to get a lot of light. And that light's going to come all the way in and hit the mass in the back of the, of the greenhouse, right? 
And then in the summertime, when the sun is high, very little sun is, is getting inside the greenhouse. And so um, a problem with greenhouses is that they often exceed 140 degrees on the inside during the summer. You have a hot sun. Yeah, no, I've been there, done that. And, oh, it kills everything in the greenhouse. It's, it sterilizes the whole environment. No, I mean, not, not getting the direct sunlight in the summertime. Well, usually, usually you're growing stuff in the winter. Like the, like the whole thing you're trying to do is, is this winter thing, right? Okay. For a greenhouse, it's like kind of what you're into. But, 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 you know, true, in the summer you can still grow some stuff. Yes? And early starts that you're going to move out of the greenhouse so they don't heat kill. Don't grow outside. Right, springtime. Springtime. And so there's, there's some stuff there. But the, 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 the key is, is that there is some sun getting in there. Um, that is direct. There's, there's most of it's going to be indirect. But with any greenhouse, you're going to lose 30% of your sunlight. No matter how magnificently glorious the glass is, or you know whatever your 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 light membrane is, you're going to lose at least 30% of your sunlight. Does anybody want to debate me on that? Bring it on. <laughs> are, do our greenhouse experts agree? Yeah. Okay, no one, no one wants to jump on that one. Okay, fine. I'll stand alone. Um, so it's kind of like, in a, I mean, in, I have a lot to say about greenhouses down that road. But at the moment, the thing is, is that uh, what we want from a greenhouse, what we fantasize about with a greenhouse, is that it's going to be plenty warm throughout the winter without augmented heat. And it's going to also, in the summertime, not kill everything. But greenhouses are a little bit famous for, um, you know, when the sun is out, it's going to be 30 degrees warmer on the inside, maybe even 50 degrees warmer. I've heard of greenhouses getting to like 170 on the inside when the sun is out and it's a hot day. Um, and then they're also famous for when it's dark and cold outside that it's almost as, as cold on the inside of a greenhouse. So heat is so difficult, so challenging with a greenhouse. There's a lot of other challenges with the greenhouse, but yes? The, um, the straw apparatus, the heat exchange, mm -hmm. is that the main thing that makes it 100% passive or the structure itself adds to the passiveness of it. Who knows what a binary search is? One person. OK. When we, when we were putting this together, there were a lot of people that said, this is not science, because you're doing seven experiments all at once. How are you going to know which one is the one that's really doing it? And I think the fact that we are, it's not as good as we had hoped, and there's still room for optimization on this structure, that it's like, I think it's fair to say at this point, probably all seven, but your question is valid from, a, uh, from the aspect of science. Now, using the power of a binary search, how might I find the answer to her question? Build seven greenhouses. Do I need to build seven? Or can I build three? So we've got seven things that we're testing here. And so then if we build a new greenhouse that tests three and it totally fails, it sucks, then it's like, well, it wasn't those three that worked. We have now reduced our search down to four from seven. So we didn't have to build seven. Well, but then, like, Ultimately, there are certain things that work in tandem. So if you're you know, taking out three things to test the four or vice versa, if one thing only works because something else that you left off of the greenhouse doesn't, like, there's See, not the True. True. Now let me add one other element. I'm going to say, fuck science. This is art. 
And so, and so it's like, I don't know which thing is doing perhaps most of the work or all of the work, or is there a combination, or is there somebody that's not pulling their weight in this list of seven? And I could just say, well, it'll work pretty damn good. You know, maybe we'll just do it just like this next time, too. Now, our Wafatis are doing quite well at not freezing, and they don't have a solar element. But then again, they also have um, uh, window quilts and things like that. <laughs> so it's, whereas this is so passive, we also forbade anybody, because some people are like, well, what if we put window quilts on the inside of the glass at night? And it's like, now it isn't passive anymore. Right. Yeah, and that was, that was my train of thought with that. If you take one thing away, then you're kind of automatically adding another thing to make it 100%. So then there was people that were also talked about like, well, what if we added a little solar panel with a fan to make the, the de-stratification pipes like, you know, move 10 times more air? Ah, it's no longer passive. And so it's like, no, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Now, I think, I think the big thing that we want to do is, I think, insulate the ceiling. Because I think, you know, the distance between the interior of the ceiling to the outside of the roof is only about a foot and a half. And there's zero insulation there. So I would imagine that if we just augmented that with an insulated ceiling, it would make a pretty big difference. And then the next thing is, is that I imagine everybody here is a gardener. I mean, I, we, plant, we planted the, the roof. Um, and I want to look at Jackie. Jackie, you didn't plant the roof, did you? No. I, OK. So. Um, we planted the roof, but it's kind of like we could add a lot more mulch up there and um, you know, do a lot more planting and things like that and build the organic matter. That'll be a type of insulation. So I'm already, so rather than thinking like, how do I break this down to find out who did the most work or whatever, I'm instead thinking about things along the lines of like, how do I make it so that rather, because I think the temperature dropped down to like 36. And it's like, how do I make it so that the lowest temperature in there is like 55? You know, and then at the same time, we had a, a high in there of over 100. And so, OK, I want that high to never go above, say, 90. And so how do I optimize the system that I have now? But the question and the curiosity is very good also. That's a lot of time and effort to, to explore that space. And I, and I hope everybody will go build a buffet of different ones of these, and then we'll all learn. But I suspect every last one of you fuckers is going to be waiting for me to do the next one and see what I find out next. Steven, get the team to work. <laughs> yes? I'm curious about the, I, I know I'm stuck on this, um, this well casing and what do you call it, stratification? Destratification pipe. Um, and again, this is just a question about variable. Is there any logic in increasing the number of those sinks? I would say yes. Um, although part of the experiment we did is we did uh, we had two uh, well casings, and so uh, east and west. And on one of them we did an inch and a half, and the other one we did an inch. Who, who thinks that the inch and a half did better? Who thinks that the inch did better? Clearly, apathy wins on this one. <laughs> inch did better. Um, and, and I think it has to do with uh, laminar flow inside the pipe. And so um, uh, I think that when you have a, a pipe, and if it's warm on this side and cool on this side, that Rather than having all of the air move up because it's so warm, you start to kind of get this cycle going between the warm side and the cool side. And so I think inch and a half allows that inch does not. Anyway, I don't know if I answered your question or you're saying it fed more. What? Yeah, the inch did better. I think it's because of laminar flow. Have you tried vents for the heating side of it? Like like if, if you're overheating, I don't know about vents and how it works in 
Okay, there are vents that are passive. So like they've got some kind of wax in them or something so that when they heat up, then they, they grow, which makes a vent plate open up and allow air in. Right, right, and we've talked about, we've got the vents there, but they're plugged right now. And uh, we've talked about trying those, but we wanted, we kind of felt like we have too many experiments going on at once right now, let's wait and see. And ever since we've done the measuring of the temperatures, we haven't had enough people up at our place. I mean, uh, the people that are up there now, they have other projects they want to do. And so we haven't come back to it to try new things like that. Yeah, I uh, mentioned during the wintertime, the sun comes through the windows and you get some of that heat stored in the mass of your, of your interior. Um, I've seen some wall painting designs that they've used black plastic rain barrels full of water to like use as a, an additional thermal mass. Have you explored that idea? <laughs> I think you might be the 200th person to suggest it to me. Um, now, if anybody wants to send me a link to that guy in Nebraska with the oranges and say, look, he's already doing a passive thing, I think you'll be about the 90th person to send me that link to help me understand this stuff. But the thing is, is that your point is a good one. Water holds temperature really well. And so if you have these black barrels holding water at the back and then the sun hits that, then um, you're right. It, it, it's a fair bit of thermal mass. Um, it's, it's generally considered, if I remember correctly, it's three or four times better than dirt. On the other hand, I don't, I mean, when you make this barrel, what's it made out of? What's your barrel? You pick one. Pick one. What? Steel. Steel. Rust. Pick another. Plastic. Plastic. <laughs> I mean, petroleum, right? Uh, you want to try wood? I mean, we could go on through all the barrels, and they all suck in a greenhouse, you know, for one reason or another. Now, plastic's probably going to be your best bet, but it's made out of petroleum products, which we are working really hard to try to reduce our use of plastic. The thing is, is that we have tons and tons and tons and tons of dirt. And so we've been going with using dirt as our thermal mass. Now, you're asking me about putting water in a barrel. Why use water when you could fill the barrel with a material that holds temperatures 20 times better, such as wax? By the way, does anybody know why we would never want to use wax? Stephen! It's flammable, sir. It's flammable. It's like, well, you know, and granted, we don't, we're not exactly flicking matches at it or anything like that, but. Man, it just seems like you're tempting fate there. I mean, that is, that is very flammable stuff. But wax holds 20 times more heat than water. Why aren't these guys using wax instead of water? But everything you're saying is true, but it's not. The, the, and the four-color brochure says it's the very best. And if you turn this brochure over, you'll find that there's other stuff written on the back in very tiny print that says, uh, there's some downsides too. So we're using dirt. And, um, and we're using probably 100 times more dirt than we would use uh, uh, barrels of water. And so uh, the, the dirt is so inert, it's not flammable. And it's not going to leak out of things as easily as, as barrels of water. And that's, that's the other thing too, is like a lot of the greenhouses that do that, then they get leaks. So we're, and then, then comes the whole thing about trying to get the heat to the water. You, you can, and, and if the, did the barrel already come black or did you have to paint it black? And in which case you've got another layer of toxins involved. So. Raw, like, like rock. the, oh, rock. Oh, yeah. oh, rock. See, now this is where Cobb is kind of cool because because Cobb's, Thermal dynamics are just like a giant rock. If you make a big gob of cob that's this size, it is. so the cool thing about having 
a big rock. So if you have, if you have a little rock, it might have thermal inertia for like a couple of hours. And, uh, but if you have a giant rock like this, it might have thermal inertia for four months, five months. And so that's why Sepp Holter's designs, he always has these giant rocks facing the south. And then he ends up with these amazing microclimates where in the middle of winter, this rock is still giving off heat from the summer. And it's like, yeah, rock. Rock is great stuff. Rock does not hold as much heat as water. Water is kind of magical this way. Not as good as wax, but still very good. But rock, it's as if it's one contiguous piece. Now, now water, of course, being a fluid, so like, um, I think a, a, a big thing is, is that if you have a pond that's kind of shallow, in the wintertime, you can go ice skating on it. But if you have a pond that's freaky deep, you can't. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this. You'll go some places and there's a body of water that has two feet of ice on it. You can go, you can go ice skating. And, and just a mile away, in the same climate, there's another body of water that doesn't have any ice on it at all. So water is going to do that thing where it's going to, you know, the, the, the bottom of the body of water is really, really deep, and it's, it's quite warm down there. And then it's going to, that warmer water is going to rise up, and the colder water is going to go down. Convection. Well, can you call it convection if it's water? Oh, yeah? That one's new to me. I, Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I know you don't like my answer, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's like there's, there's upsides and downsides. Yes? I remember looking at this issue years ago. There was a, a company that was making a foil-based um, you know, wall. It was like sort of a foil back with uh, material that had great thermal retention uh, in packets. Sort of on the wall. And it seemed to be a fairly like middle ground um, resolution for materials. Uh, it definitely was too space age for this application, but right, you're not going to go out in the woods and find this this reflective material and yeah, and the packets. It's the packet tree. But but it was sort of the, the properties of beeswax in a non-flammable material that was, you know, coated the wall and avoided the barrel. So. All right, so he's got, um, uh, he saw something somewhere, an article maybe, on, on a reflective material combined with a packet of goo that is going to hold heat really, really well. And, um, and as you can see, the projects that we do are like, uh, we got these logs off of our property. We got this mud off of our property. We got these rocks off of our property. Actually, I think the gravel in this picture we actually bought. <laughs> but we bought it local. This, that's local gravel right there. Probably about $4 worth. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to, I want to skip past, I mean, I think a, when I was young, I worked for the Northwest Power Planning Council as a librarian, and I got to see um, I got to see these people who really, really cared about solving problems in the Pacific Northwest that our energy brings to us. Should we build another nuclear power plant? And if we don't, then what are we going to build? I mean, Let's analyze the environmental disaster for each of these choices and try to figure out how to meet the energy needs of the people in this region in the best way we can come up with. The joke in the office was conservation because nobody is going to conserve. Nobody ever does. The Northwest Power Planning Council has put out tons of information, all kinds of articles for newspapers and things like that. That was a newspaper. That's something we used to do a long time ago, which we don't do anymore. But uh, they put all this information out to try to convince people to try a thing that would save them some power. And, and so somehow I got kind of obsessed on this topic. 
and um, and it has to do with like how to improve the world that we live in because we're kind of making a toxic shitstorm. Would you say, Dr. Watson? Yeah, we're kind of. Even in Missoula, the air that we breathe right now, a little on the questionable side maybe, and uh, stuff in our soils, and, and, and there's other things that are coming that are like rather scary. And it's like, uh, so. <clears throat> Anybody remember Alberton and the chlorine train? Yeah. What's that? Oh, oh, even better. I'm, I'm so relieved. I remember deciding to take a day trip to Bozeman that day. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I uh, have traveled this path with a bit of an obsession towards trying to solve a lot of these problems. And so it's like, rather than, because so much of the conservation message is about sacrifice. And uh, I believe I have come up with a list of about 100 things that will make your life more luxuriant while simultaneously solving a lot of global problems. And so it's, it's kind of like the whole thing about there's a big marketing campaign behind these fucking light bulbs telling you how great they are. They're not. They are not. They're a toxic shitstorm. And... Um, uh, of course, you know, everybody's excited about electric cars, and it is an improvement in many ways, but only a tiny one. So I kind of feel like the work that I'm doing, and, and I'm getting, I'm still answering your question, and it's just weird, <laughs> is to come up with recipes so that people can have a more luxuriant life um, without all the toxic gick. So what's in those packets? I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm a little concerned about what's on the outside of the, what are the packets made out of? What's, what's the reflective material made out of? And then there's the stuff that they tell us, and then there's the stuff they've decided to not share. And it might be 20 years until, Roundup was considered so good, so environmentally friendly that you could drink it. And, and, I know that, that many of us fought. I imagine Dr. Watson fought and complained and said, it's not. And it took 20 some years, 25 years, until the evidence finally proved it's toxic. And so, oh, have they come up with something new now that hasn't been proven to be toxic yet? So, I mean, it kind of is like the whole clopyrrolid, aminopyrrolid thing. You know, they keep coming up with a new, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. Did I answer your question sufficiently? It's like, I suspect that the water thing and the thing that you suggest and the wax thing all would work really well. I choose a path made from more natural ingredients. And, and I'm just a weirdo that way. And I hope that by putting all this effort down this road that some people will observe and say, I want to try that too, or at least pieces of it. Yes? I'm just curious, you said your um, well casing when it went down the Well, it's a 20 foot long casing, and we kind of saw like a foot of it sticking up right there, so. I know, I meant, like, so did you need to do, obviously you meant to do that. Was it just because of the price of just buying one casing? Or did you need to do that? Probably would be more beneficial, but it's like. What was the question? Oh, the question is: is uh, hey, if 20 feet of of those, if you got a 20 foot uh, well casing that you put down there for your thermal well, if 20 feet is good, wouldn't 40 feet be twice as good? You know, keep going. You know, and and so I kind of wonder if at 40 feet, if I might discover water. <laughs> um, uh, but the other thing is, is that um, we use the excavator to dig uh, the, the, the ground to put those well casings in. And um, we used a lot of diesel to do that. And to go 40, another 20 feet down, 
that would have probably burned six times as much diesel. Although when we were all done, we kind of felt like, let's not ever do it that way again. We'll, we kind of came up with this idea of like digging manually, digging a hole manually, which when you dig a hole manually and you go over 20 feet, I think about 30 feet deep, it becomes like such an enormous job that you'll say, 30 feet seems good to me, up the rest of you. <laughs> I think we're done here. So it, it gets to be quite a deal. Now, of course, if you've got a well drilling rig, they can do it lickety split. And uh, they're going to want some coin for that. But I, OK, from a theoretical standpoint, I think, I think that uh, there is some truth to what you're saying. But maybe not. It might, it might you know, the, the first thought is, is, oh, it'll double. But actually, I think it's going to be more like a 20% improvement if you doubled the length of that pipe. All right. So what's the diameter on those uh, well casings that you're using? I'm pretty sure it's six. Jackie, do you remember? You got to spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It looks like about six, roughly. Yes. Okay. And then you were saying the one inch and the one and a half inch was the pipe that you put into the well casing? Okay. And one inch performed better. So we put uh, tracking thermometers down the well. So okay. at the top of the well casing, there's a little paper clip right there, which is tied to a piece of string like paracord, which is tied to a tracking thermometer that's way the hell down in there. And then um, uh, anyway, we have a way of like saying, dear cell phone, talk to that contraption. And then it'll give us the data. And, um, but what was happening was is that we had a tracking thermometer, thermometer down each well. And um, for uh, three weeks, we didn't put the, uh, um, the, the other pipe inside, the uh, destratification pipe inside yet. And it was a solid 46.2. And so around here, it's about the temperature of when you dig down 20 feet, you're going to get a very constant temperature. And um, that constant temperature is going to be different in, in different parts of the country. But here, at least at my place, it's apparently 46.2. And it was very, very solid, 46.2. OK, so then the destratification pipes went in. And we would see every day it would go up like a, a tenth of a degree or so. And, uh, and then it would drop back down a bit. But the, the tracking thermometer had enough resolution that we could kind of see this graph kind of going like this for each day. So it was getting just a little bit higher every day. But the, uh, the pipe, the thermal well with the one inch pipe was kicking ass over the inch and a half pipe. And you said that pipe was made of steel? The pipe? That is in the that is behind the glass, sitting right behind the glass, is copper, mm -hmm. uh, which we later painted black. So uh, it's black and pipe. And then uh, once you get past, once you get below the glass, then it switches over to a poly pipe. Okay. Yeah. What's the approximate volume of the greenhouse? That Wow, I, I've never thought to do the math. Um, I'm just curious. <clears throat> like, about sizing it up or well, we had a lot of people that were. So this greenhouse exists because of a Kickstarter. So uh, we said, you know, does anybody want us to do this experiment? And we were a little flabbergasted by the number of people that said yes. <laughs> and so. Uh, um, but there were a lot of those people that said, you know, you should make it like 10 times bigger. And, and my thought is, is it's like, we've got way too many experiments going on here. Let's, let's experiment with this first. But I believe that the interior space is something on the order of 10 by 10. And uh, that's not volume, that's going to be area. And, uh, and then, of course, there's a sloped front surface, and then there's some sloped uh, roofy kind of stuff, and, 
And uh, then there, then you, when you're trying to calculate volume, do you include what's below the walkway? Uh, do you include what's inside the thermal wells? So it's like, ah. So I've never even contemplated what is the volume of that space. But volume is important because when you have a lot of air in a greenhouse, then you, that's a lot of air you got to keep warm if you're going to keep the greenhouse warm. And so that, I think, was the very first of the seven different things in our experiments is to reduce the overall air volume. And so instead of making it so people could stand up in the greenhouse and walk around on flat ground, we made a walkway that was, you know, a trench. And so then you had um, uh, beds that you planted into in the front and the back? Yes. Yes. And I think uh, there was a little bit of that that happened last winter. Um, I know that the one in the back is all set up to be a gray water system with fungi, which we have not yet activated. <clears throat> and if we can get a dozen people who want to come out and be part of our project and help us get caught up on everything, we might actually get to it this year. Well, sir, where exactly are you? Is there a town nearby? Or oh, there is a town nearby and we are less than an hour from Missoula, Montana. Now, the subtext of it is, I'd rather not say. And so you're going to be graceful and, and read that subtext and go, I see. I understand. Now, um, uh, that opens up a bunch of other conversations, which I'm going to just step gently around. But. Uh, uh, the, 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 okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right, the key is, is that uh, uh, the back one was supposed to be for gray water. There were some plants growing there. Are there plants in there now, Stephen? Yeah, okay. Interesting thing. We got past the 12 below without a problem. But as the winter wore on, the temperature at the bottom of the thermal wells started to drop. And so the whole design is to be able to carry the heat of the summer through the winter. But I got to tell you, as we got to the end of winter and in the, in the early spring, that that space was cooling off a fair bit. We were losing our thermal inertia. And so, uh, but we, we managed to make it through. Now, again, I think there's a lot of ways to optimize that structure so it'll perform even better. But I think the important thing to walk away from all of this is we fucking rock. We, we knocked it out of the park. We've accomplished things that nobody has ever accomplished before. And we did it with natural materials, or dominantly natural materials. Ah. Caleb Larson. Who here knows Caleb Larson? Okay, no, nobody. He's a, he is an expert timber framer in the area. And uh, we asked him as part of the movie project to come down and evaluate Josiah's work. And uh, he gave it an A+. Uh, he made some suggestions about how he might have done some joinery slightly differently. And I thought, I thought the things he had to say was really fascinating. But again, we're talking about joinery, which I could talk about all day, but I, I got the subtext. You guys are not as interested as I am. <clears throat> Here you can kind of see the destratification pipes. We, we ended up putting a little bit of insulation behind each one. And there's a, uh, behind each pipe, there's also a, a reflective half tube. Uh, it's, just, it's just a cardboard tube with some foil on it. So uh, probably not as high tech as the reflective stuff that was being mentioned earlier, but uh, it did make a difference. We saw, once we started implementing each of these steps, we saw a big leap in the temperatures go up down at the bottom of those thermal wells. <clears throat> all right. I, with all this stuff that we're doing with this greenhouse and with our Wafati structures, we are trying to get to a point where we can have a home that is warm all winter with zero heat in Montana, and therefore the carbon footprint is zero. The other toxic nightmare, the other environmental disasters that happen on the other end of that wire uh, are, are also at zero. We're not using any of that. Um, 
And uh, we could sit here and t we could try to list off all of the power that's on the other end of that wire, that which is the worst, which is the best, and even the best is still a, a, an environmental disaster. And so it's kind of like the, the best way to get to the point of uh, reducing the environmental disaster by a factor of 10 is to have recipes so we can have a more luxuriant life while simultaneously using one-tenth of the overall uh, energy. So, do to do to do. I think these pictures are pretty nice. Here's the graphs. So, oh, here you can see the kind of the cool little graph. So here you can see the daily little bumps. Bumpity, bumpity, bump. See, I think this is a 30-day thing. So you can see 30 little, little bumps. And this, this one must have been kind of a cloudy day, maybe. And this might have been a really sunny day. And you can kind of see how the temperatures are slowly going up. And um, I think it says that 46.7 here and 47.3 here. So it's, it's, for this particular month, it didn't go up by a full degree. But um, I think that in time, we can get it to be cumulative over years. So five years from now, this whole structure might be five or six degrees warmer on average. Well, when we started, it was a hard 46.2 degrees in there, right? And then um, maybe when we get to that exact same point in time one year later, maybe it'll be 46.9. And then a year after that, it'll be 47.5. I, I did say that. Absolutely true. So the temperature is going to go up when the sun is shining, especially in the summer and the fall. And then it's going to drop off late winter and in the spring. But it doesn't drop down to as low as it was down here. And then it goes back up. That is my theory. We haven't been doing this enough. We, we haven't collected that data in a while. And we, we probably need to go over there. And yeah, Stephen's looking all, look, I think he actually is blushing. Look how red he is. <laughs> we have, there's so many projects we're working on. We probably have about 100 projects we're working on simultaneously at any time. And, and it's like there's other things we want to do first. And so, but this is my theory that possibly each year that temperature will go up a little bit. And so five years from now, the whole temperature of the greenhouse might be significantly warmer. So, all right, I thought I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Are we taking into account the people that are in the, in the system, the heat energy they add to it? Well, uh, last year when we measured it, there was a guy who would go in with his cell phone to get all the tracking data. And so he would open the door, letting all that cold air in, and he was bundled up to the nines, thus insulating his body heat from the experiment to some degree. But the experiment was also getting kind of screwed by him opening that door in order to get the, so you know, Measuring something affects the results. At the same time, uh, we did not have anybody spending any significant time in there. And so um, I kind of feel like there were pluses and minuses, but for the most part, people went in there only once a week for a very short time. It's for you! <laughs> And that's this winter. But the last two summers have also been ridiculously hot. And so, I mean, really the thing to do is, in order to properly answer these questions, we got to, I mean, one of the things is, is I'm pretty sure that the batteries are probably dead in those tracking thermometers. And so we need to pull them out replace the battery, put them back in, get them tracking the temperatures again. But we need to collect the data. 
and somebody needs to go through the data and try to see if there's summaries that can be made. And then we need to do it year after year. And the thing is, is that there's so many other projects, everybody, would want to, everybody wants to work on all these other projects instead. There's, there's probably some of that too. I mean, I, when I gardened in Missoula, <clears throat> 1993, I remember that we had a 90-day growing season in Missoula, that your average last frost date was June 1st, and your average first frost date was September 1st. Seems to me like we added 20 days onto either end of the growing season. Mysteriously, for for no reason, <laughs> just just happened. Yes. Did you have anything growing in this greenhouse when you were running these measurements? I think so. I think that there was somebody had some uh, some jalapeno peppers growing in there, and but I but the peppers did not make it through the season, and I and I think it's possible that something with the watering. What? We we had our last. This year. Of, yeah, this year. Our, 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 our. That's what his question was, but go ahead. This year, I think the, the last tomatoes and peppers were taken out of there in November. Okay. Just because we're hungry. They could have gone longer, but we craved them. So, uh, now was, there was a question here for a moment, but maybe you got answered and they don't care. Okay, never mind. All right, go ahead. I was just uh, thinking about the people coming in and out of the greenhouse and the effect that has had on it. And it reminds me of a story of a guy who's doing permaculture in Washington State. And he did, uh, he attached the greenhouse to, the, to his house and then put a composting toilet in it. And so it was with the, what of the other, one of the stoves you were talking about in the house. The rocket mass heater? Yeah. In the house? The whole thing was kind of, you know, I thought it was a nice system. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to your thing here in just a sec. And, and so first I want to say, um, having a composting toilet in your home is OK. In Missoula County, of course, it's illegal. Um, uh, a lot of people have put a lot of work into trying to get it to be legal. Um, but, uh, and I think a composting toilet inside your house is fine. But too many people try to heat uh, greenhouses by having a compost pile in their greenhouse. I want to discourage you from doing that. So, um, I mean, it's effectively doing the same thing as the composting toilet, but on a much, much larger scale. And so, um, oh, geez, I want to go into a, an hour-long thing about compost. But, yeah, how we, I mean, this clock says it's like 11.30 at night. 7.20. Okay, so I've, I've got time. Um, I'm not going to go into the compost thing right now, but the thing is, is that composting, the composting process, puts off a lot of interesting gases. Gases that might not be the best thing for you to breathe in. And it might not be the thing that's best for your growies. Now, I got to say that um, I went to a rocket mass heater workshop that was over in uh, uh, Frenchtown. Uh, and this was about 12 years ago, um, 11 years ago. Anyway, did the workshop. It was amazing. We had some of the most brilliant people in rocket mass heaters there. It was an excellent workshop. We've, we took video of it. The video is available on permies.com. OK. There was a guy there, one of the students. And he came up with this idea that he thought was genius. He didn't realize that thousands of dumb fucks have come before him and had the same dumb fuck idea. I'm going to put a rocket mass heater in my greenhouse and plants because the exhaust of a rocket mass heater is merely pure steam and carbon dioxide. <gasps> plants love carbon dioxide. This idea is genius. So me and the actually smart people that were there told him, no, don't do that. Not only will you kill yourself, you will kill all of your plants. 
he then pointed out to us that we are retarded and he is a genius. And that just because he had the idea, it must therefore be excellent. So after he left, the rest of us went and recorded a podcast for two hours going into excruciating detail on why this is a terrible idea. If nothing else, the rocket mass heater itself consumes oxygen. It has fire. So it takes the oxygen and it gives off carbon dioxide. So eventually the fire will go out because there's no more oxygen in the space. Another thing that this guy could not hear because of his genius blocking our words uh, is that plants, while they do thrive, if you bump up their carbon dioxide just a pinch during the day, when it's probably pretty warm in your greenhouse already, so you're not running the rocket mass heater anyway. But plants at night, they use oxygen. They don't use carbon dioxide at night. So you're making it shitty for them at night when it's cold. So, and a rocket mass heater puts out uh, mostly, like for most of the burn, it's almost pure steam and carbon dioxide. But at the beginning, there's still some smoke. And it's like, so that's going into the air and it's not getting out. So, uh, and at the beginning of the burn, at the end of the burn, there's also going to be a little bit of carbon monoxide, but we vent that to the outside. And this, this genius is going to not vent to the outside. Okay, before we answer questions over here, there was a question back here. She's been so very patient. <laughs> Uh, I'm really curious about greenhouses as a way to harbor tropical plant beloveds. And, um, and just in looking at your design and hearing people ask about, like, how do you grow things when you're in the middle of summer? Do you feel like the wapati that you're, you're describing and just the design that you've been talking about is something that's acceptable for plants that are still seeking full sun um, in the summer? All right, tropical plants that want full sun. I mean, part of it is, is when you build a greenhouse, you're going to eliminate 30% of the light they're going to get. But a lot of tropical plants are subcanopy. I mean, the way that you grow tropical plants is so radically different. Have you read the Poisonwood Bible? There's a great example. Who's read the Poisonwood Bible? Few people. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, the way you do horticulture in a tropical area is so very different. But uh, when you have a greenhouse, you automatically eliminate 30% of the sun. And so um, there's all these complexities that come up with that. The other thing is, is that uh, you have eliminated nature. And so you're going to take on all of nature's jobs. And that can present itself as many flavors of comedy. And so, who here has done a whole bunch of greenhouse stuff and experienced this comedy I speak of? Go ahead, hold your hand way up there. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, you know what would really add some comedy? Let's grow tropicals. And it's like, and then it's like, it's not just that they're frost sensitive. It's like they don't like temperatures below 50, which is kind of what you're talking about. I love the idea that we're going to take this to the next level. And we're going to be able to, to keep it at 50 or better. Um, eventually. And I, th I, I think this is just step one. Um, and I think we're going to try and do it more with the Wafati homes before we try to do any more down the road of, of the Wafati greenhouses. But it is possible to take this design and, for your purposes, and augment it. And, um, uh, you know, then get the thing that you seek. And you know, with rocket mass heaters, it provides a very steady heat. And at the same time, the design of this structure has so much thermal mass that you'll run that rocket mass heater and it'll, it'll carry that heat that you generated for a week or two. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer questions over here now. Thank you, sir. Um, please forgive me for this question. <laughs> She's asking for forgiveness in advance. Okay, you've got that chair. Here's my chair. Go ahead. Okay, you were talking about rhubarb and apples being planted next to each other. It was very uh, good for both of them. 
So usually when I give a presentation, I show up plenty early and, um, and I make it clear that people can ask questions about any topic that they want until the presentation officially starts. So I was talking about growies and how I'm an advocate for diversity. And you said alfalfa and something else are really good for each other. So rhubarb and uh, fruit trees go together very well. In permaculture, the famous guild plant is the comfrey. And um, uh, I think Stefan, whatever, the, the, the permaculture orchard guy up in Canada, he, he doesn't like comfrey. I think, I think he's wrong. There's a lot of stuff he says. I, there's a lot of stuff he says I think is brilliant. There's a lot of stuff he says I think is wrong. We have a difference of opinion. But uh, so you're asking about guilds. You start talking about guilds and what plants love being next to other plants. Oh, that's a beautiful and massive topic. May I suggest a website? You simply stopped and didn't give us the second part of it. You say alfalfa and. So, there's, so there was a, an apple tree and a rhubarb. Those two go together very well. And then, and then there happened to be some alfalfa that grew next to them. And then um, basically the, the apple tree and the rhubarb grew magnificently and gloriously because they were so happy being next to each other plus next to the alfalfa. And it's a bit of an evidence of how uh, one of the primary things to make plants so very happy, I believe, is the root exudate from other species of plants, which is oftentimes accelerated with mycelium. So. Do you know John Boykendall, who is the seed saver? Anyway, he said that his parents taught him when the last week or so of the peas were almost finished, they would turn them over and under the soil and use that as the bedding for the next plant. I wondered what your take might be on. Okay, uh, so she's asking about horticultural stuff, which, oh, I am so tempted to travel this road. At the same time, I need to finish giving this presentation about a greenhouse. <laughs> so, and there were other questions. So, maybe after the presentation, we can circle back to that. And, and um, I promise you will hate all of my answers. <laughs> it's, I have a different school of thought than, than many people. Dr. Watson. I just want to make a real quick announcement before too many people left. And that is, there's a group in town here called the Thousand New Gardens. Ah. It was started by students and community members, and they vowed a little over a decade ago to put a thousand new gardens into the yards of the Zulians. And you'll say, who wants a garden but needs help to put it in? And so they put in hundreds and hundreds of gardens. Things kind of shrunk during the COVID. We're trying to build back after COVID. And we have a lot of student members, but we don't have very many community members. We would like, like to have more community members. And what happens is the students plan a dig day where they go out and put gardens in for people who need help putting in a garden. And they'll just notify you, we're doing it on this day. If you want to come help us, you know, meet at this place, and we'll divide up and go, go to various sites and help people put in gardens. So I've got a sign-up sheet here name, email, or phone number, something like that, so that we can notify you when dig day is going to take place. Thank you. Do you uh, have a phone number for them? For them? Yes. You can call me at the university, sure. which is Vicki Watson, 406-243-5153. Thank you so much. A Thousand Gardens Project is an excellent project. I think I was, I went and I gave some support. They asked me to come and speak, like, I think their first year. It was, then it was Max and Jeff were kind of running it. Is Jeff still involved? I'm sure he is. He loves that program. We're doing good things of that sort, but elsewhere. Okay, all right. All right, you and then you. Quick question on her. I think you like the apple and rhubarb <laughs> because of the pies you can make out of it. 
But the question I have for you. Oh, good. Somebody listens to my podcast. Yeah. But, um, God is up next. Uh-huh. But, um, the question I have if you have water approximately five, you hit water approximately five feet down. In Missoula? Not in Missoula. Some places in Missoula. Yeah, two hours away. Okay. Um, can you use that water where it holds up the heat into I would say that there are ways, yes. But, but with this, then, and that's an excellent question because this will never go up. And so, and I imagine that your water that you're going to bump into is going to be um, cold, really cold. The key is, is that, um, like, like, if you've got a thermal well that goes down and it hits, this, hits your water, then any heat that you, you put there is going to go away. Because the water, even though it's groundwater, is moving. It does, you, know, you don't see it moving much, but it is moving. I mean, that would be pretty rare if it's not moving. Um, but yeah, the, the water is going to, and then if you warmed it up, well, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna carry your heat away very quickly, so unless it's probably you, not gonna work. Unless you make it Ooh. By in a oh, even still, it's not gonna work. You know, you'd have to have a big thermal mass down there that is not gonna be, is not gonna dissolve in the face of water. All right, so then, okay, let's, oh wait, you were next, yeah. you were next, yeah, damn right I'm next, what are you pointing to her for? Okay. No, so I wanted to circle back on the tropical plant point, okay. um, being that, you know, the inside of the walls are made out of cob, um, if it were to get to the point of being able to do tropical plants, wouldn't humidity <gasps> be an issue? Oh, 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 good one, good one, okay, a lot of greenhouses, humidity is an issue. Everything is going to turn to mold real fast. In fact, I think that's the theme song from Hawaii, isn't it? Everything will turn to mold in a week. So, uh, but our thermal wells take all of that warm, moist air down in the cold thermal well, and then all that water is going to condense on that cold, cold pipe. And then what comes back up tends to be a hell of a lot drier. This has been our experience so far, but we have a lot more testing to do. But yeah, your question about humidity is a very good one. That's, that's why a lot of people told us we can't build a greenhouse out of wood because it's going to turn to compost really fast. But they've also said that about pretty much everything that we build because we don't paint it. And uh, yet we've got structures that are nine years old now. So um, uh, standing up and doing and holding up strong. And then there was a question over here somewhere. Yeah. Um, I was curious on your thoughts on subterranean greenhouses. Ah. So there's many flavors of subterranean greenhouses. I mean, there's the pit greenhouses. So uh, and then there's like the wallapini. Uh, there's some stuff that was done in Russia that's very fascinating. But there's stuff that's like. Like, wow, that is a hole that goes like 40 feet into the ground, and they're growing trees there. I'm not familiar with a lot of those. Uh, I say I was living and working at this place in North Carolina that had a subterranean, a really, like the height of this room, subterranean greenhouse, where just the ceiling was all, well, that wasn't glass, what was it? I don't know. It was polyvinyl. Um, Plastic. Yeah. But I'm just curious about your thoughts in terms of this, like, in terms of... Well, that general style. So it's, that's going to either be, so she's talking about a subterranean greenhouse, which is basically anything where the ground level is, is lower. Um, and and that, in this particular case, it was maybe 12 feet lower, 10 or 12 feet lower. And it had a plastic, clear plastic ceiling slash roof. Um, and so I think that qualifies as a pit greenhouse. And when you get them down that deep, 
then what happens is, is that the, the ground is kind of that constant 46.2 degrees. And, um, and so what happens is, is that generally they never get colder than, uh, or at least the, the ground doesn't get colder than 46.2. But when the, the much, much colder air comes in, then um, now you're kind of fighting in this space between 32 and 46.2. So that means you're above freezing, but it's also never really gets all that warm either. So we feel like, so with that, you're kind of like, that's the end of the road. What you, they've, there's not much they can do to optimize that system. But with ours, we feel like we have lots and lots and lots of things we can do to further optimize our system. Okay, any other questions at this point? Yes? So Jerome Ostenkowski is at the 9,000 foot level in Colorado. And I've been to his place. <clears throat> it is an interesting greenhouse. Um, I've got things to say. But let me try to finish this presentation first. <laughs> zero cement, zero paint, zero energy, Less than 1% of the plastic and glue used in standard greenhouses. All right, so it turns out now I'm at the end of the presentation. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember. <laughs> I was around here somewhere. Bump, there it is, the end. I think, is there anything? Oh, oh yeah, here's, here's all of my little websites and then this, this same little thing that kind of, there it goes, yeah. Um, any other any other questions about the Wafati greenhouse? So we're are we how are we doing on time? The library is going to do this message in five minutes that says piss off. So <laughs> my these being quick. Uh, the well casing, from what I'm reading between the lines, you don't have a cap on the bottom, right? That is correct. Open to the soil. That is correct. Okay. okay. I'm being asked about permitting. And so, of course, uh, the government feels very strongly, thou shalt not innovate. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, you cannot build that because it has not been built before. So, that is an issue for many people. And um, if uh, I, and I happen to live in a place where it's less of an issue, so I have I have selected a location so that I can do the experiments I need to do. I know that that's very vague, and you know it's going to suck in a lot of ways and stuff like that. It's like the thing I say about rocket mass heaters. With rocket mass heaters, um, the I tell people. Whatever you do, do what the government says, just like everybody did with pot. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So, uh, because nobody touched pot until the government said it was okay, <laughs> right? And so, um, it doesn't matter that a rocket mass heater saves the world or saves you thousands of dollars a year. Those things don't matter. Uh, it, what matters is, is that you obey your government overlords. So, um, uh, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on beyond that now with just minutes to spare. And now that several people have left, <laughs> I brought gifts. <laughs> and, and with all those other people here, there weren't enough for everybody. So I am the author of two books, but there's this most recent book that I wrote, um, and uh, uh, as part of the Kickstarter, we promised to hand out a certain number of books for free to people that might enjoy them. So I have brought, I think, 24 copies of, of this book, which uh, came out last year. 
And um, this is uh, this is, has to do with the BB20, the skip thing we were talking about earlier, um, where uh, it's basically a list of a thousand projects, and it starts by talking about Mike Ayler of all people, because Mike would contact me once a month and beg me to give him somebody worthy to inherit his land because he felt like you know his time was about up and he, did, he didn't want somebody he wanted somebody to come in and continue his projects and continue his greenhouse continue his his underground homes and things of that nature <clears throat> so i did send somebody over but uh, shortly after they arrived mike died so he didn't have time to change his will and stuff like that but the point, uh, the, the primary function of this book, but, but there's, I'd say, three quarters of the people that, that are into this stuff um, are not after the primary function. So the primary function is, is that there are industrious youth and there are elderly landowners like Mike who are desperately trying to find somebody worthy to will their land to. And this is about documenting worthy. So I have a bunch of these. And I'm glad to give one every. And I brought the permaculture playing cards. So uh, what do you think, Dr. Watson? Are these cards all right? <laughs>